All right, in this video, we're going to go ahead and write a couple extension methods that we're going to use on Photon. Um, the first ones we're going to write, very, very simple. They're just going to clean up this code right here where we can actually acquire a, a parameter from a dictionary or from a, um, a request object or event or whatever uh, very easily. They're just two really simple methods. I just want to get that out of the way right now really quickly because the next part of this video is also going to be very short. We are just simply going to write code that's going to allow us to use our deferred API with Photon fibers. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's jump into our server project, buzzmmo.server. And I, I usually, uh, I'm going to create a, a file here called extensions. I usually like making a, um, a namespace for all of my extension methods. It, it makes things a lot easier to find your extension methods because sometimes you forget where your extension methods are. And it also makes it so your extension methods don't cloud up your the, the types that you're extending if you really don't want those extension methods available. So let's go ahead and create a new class, and this one's going to be called Photon Extensions. So this is just going to be the class that's going to be used for some really simple helpers. So let's go ahead and, and figure that out real fast. I'm simply going to do a public static t get t this of i event data. Come on, you can do it. That and then event code parameter. So event code parameter, and we're simply going to call this parameter. And this is simply going to return cast to t that cast to byte parameter. And then the next one we're going to write is actually going to have the exact same signature, or not the exact same signature, but the exact same body. So I'm just going to copy and paste this, and I'm just going to change the uh, the thing that we're extending to operation request. So. Basically, with these two extensions, um, we'll be able to easily get parameters out. I'm also going to write two similar or one more very similar extension method, but I'm going to do it in the base project. And the reason I'm writing uh, the, the other extension methods in the base project is because these other extension methods, which will be the exact same things as these, except uh, they're going to accept dictionaries, a byte, and object. They'll clean up our client code a little bit. I wish I wrote these extension methods earlier, but um, I didn't, so we're doing that now. So we're going to do a dictionary extension, ugh, dic, diction, dictionary extension method. That took way longer to type than I wanted it to. And we're simply going to have the same thing. We're going to have public static t get of t. But here, the thing we're extending is a dictionary of byte and object. And for this, we're going to take in, uh, it'll be called that, like I usually do. Uh, for the thing that we're extending and then we'll take an event code parameter parameter and this is simply going to say return cast to t that byte parameter now we could also write um, try get methods as well if you want to but i haven't found a use for them uh, generally speaking when i want to get a parameter passed from the server to the client or vice versa I would consider it an error if that parameter didn't exist. And that that will happen with the way I've written this code since we're using the indexer. The indexer will throw an exception if that parameter isn't found. So we don't have to do a bunch of checks to make sure that these parameters exist. We can just use them. And if they fail, that means there was a programming error. Our process will crash and burn and we'll fix it. So uh, then we're going to do the same thing. But instead of event code parameter, we're going to do operation parameter. And that's it. So now, for example, I'm not going to do this all, uh, all over the code base. We'll just do this for new code. But for example, if I jump into the client context, now um, this uh, this method ID, instead of cast a byte request parameter, cast a byte operation method ID, we can simply do method ID equals request parameters get. And for this, I'm having to hold down Alt, Shift, and Space. And then uh, ReSharper is going to pick up the fact I have an extension method that hasn't been imported. For you guys without ReSharper, make sure you do add the buzzmmo base extensions import at the top. So we'll do get of byte, because that's the type of the value we want, and then operation parameter method ID. So this code is, uh, compare these two lines, they do the exact same thing, but one is uh, a lot easier to read and a lot more straightforward. So we'll nuke that, and uh, we'll do the same thing with argument bytes. And I'll say argument bytes equals request parameters get of byte array, and then pass in operation parameter argument bytes. And then we can nuke this line down here because it does the exact same thing. So really straightforward, easy to do. I think we have, don't we have one more of these? Um, 
Yeah, right here on, on line 81 when we get our system invoke ID. So I can simply say request parameters, get of byte, and then operation parameter, system invoke ID. So a lot cleaner, a lot less verbose, a lot less repetitive. So those are our first set of extension methods. Well, why are you complaining? Uh, possible system null reference exception. That's fine. Uh, if there's a null reference exception here, I want it to crash the uh, the request so it gets logged and we can fix it because that would be a programming error and programming errors should crash, crash, the, pros bleh, crash the request. So um, moving on, let's go ahead and do our, our fiber extensions. So I'm going to hop down here into buzzmo.server under extensions and I'm going to write fiber extensions. And there'll be a handful of these, and I'm sorry for the um, uh, uh, the uh, repetition that we're going to have to deal with when writing these, but there's no other way. Now, fortunately, when writing these, uh, the most important thing you should pay attention to is the signature of the method, because um, the signature of the method will determine if uh, or what kind of code that we have to write for making all these overloads work. So we're just trying to write the same method a bunch of times, and that's in queue deferred. But there's so many different ways that in queue deferred can be used. And in, in some context, we we simply want to invoke an action and then immediately resolve the deferred. So in that case, we would just go off and do something, and unless there was an error, that deferred would succeed, otherwise it would fail. But we also have to do deferreds that return data and we need to do deferred of t variants of both of those. And you know, this is statically typed language, so we have to kind of play with the type system and make it happy. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna make the type system happy by creating 10 million overloads of the exact same method. So let's go ahead and start off. I'm gonna do public static deferred. So make sure you get that imported. And in Q deferred, um, in Q deferred. This I fiber, uh, come on, you can do it. That and then action, action. Now I'm not gonna write this method. I'm actually gonna write the prototypes for all these methods first, but I do wanna talk a little bit about fiber and, and, and I fiber and what that is. I know that I've kind of in, implicitly talked about what it does and what it is in the past, but if you're not familiar with Photon, the concept of a fiber is a sort of synchronization context where you can tell the fiber to go do something and you can tell the fiber to go do something else and the fiber will, will ensure that the first thing you told it to do will execute before the next thing um, you told it to do. So this kind of gets rid of locks. That's the whole idea here. We'll still use locks every now and then, but fibers are how in Photon you kind of asynchronously run your code, but you make sure that the little bits that need to be ran synchronously are ran synchronously, even if they're on a, they end up on a different thread in the thread pool or a new thread gets created or whatever. So fibers are awesome. And, and the primary thing that, that you do with fibers is you do in queue. And in queue simply takes in an action, an action delegate. And that's all it does. And that's primarily what you're gonna be using a fiber for. And that simply goes out and schedules a thing to happen on this particular fiber. And that's it. And we're gonna be basing, obviously based off the name here in queue deferred, we're gonna be basing pretty much all of our overloads of this off of the in queue method on the iFiber. So let's go ahead and write out our other prototypes here so you guys know kind of where I'm going with this. And we kind of have a roadmap of, of which overloads we need. So uh, this is the simplest one. Uh, this in queue deferred is simply going to resolve the deferred if the action succeeds or reject the deferred if there's an exception while running this action. Next up, I want to do a deferred, um, another in queue deferred. I'm just going to get this on my clipboard. I can't spell for some reason today. Um, this I fiber that, and this one's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be a funk of deferred action. Now, um, so the funk of deferred implies that the action that we wanna execute is gonna return another deferred. And the behavior we want with this one is we wanna queue up this action, we wanna run this action, but then we want to, when that action is done, we want to run another action and then have finally the action that was ran at the end be returned. So that's what that guy does. Um, next up, we get into our deferred of T's. So deferreds that return responses. So we'll do a public static deferred of T in Q deferred of T, this I fiber, that, and this is gonna take a func T action. So this should be pretty self-explanatory here. We return a deferred that accepts a function that returns an object. 
And basically, when this object, uh, when this function succeeds, or when this method succeeds, or delegate rather, it will set the deferred's value to whatever was returned by this action. And of course, if an exception is thrown, we reject the deferred which is the same behavior pretty much all of these things are going to have. So um, next up, we're going to have another in queue deferred. So um, this is going to return a deferred of T2, and it's going to be called in queue deferred. It's going to take in a T. Um, let's just do, actually, let's instead of T2, let's do T out. And then for this, we'll do T in and then um, T out. So we take in two generic parameters here. We're going to do an I fiber that, and we're taking a func of deferred of t in called action. So this one is uh, basically the equivalent to this right here. So we, we have a function, but the function doesn't return a straight up value. It returns a deferred of a value. So that way we can kind of um, uh, chain up different deferreds. And it's important here that we take in these two generic parameters here, t in and t out, because maybe the deferred that's returned by this delegate that was passed in has a different value type than the deferred that we want, or that was originally used. So, um, stuff and things. Let's see. I'm also going to write a, a two more of these, and they're going to be a little different, and they're going to kind of look a little silly. And I don't know if we're going to use them, but I think it'd be a good idea to use this or to have this available. So I'll have a public static deferred in queue deferred this I fiber that. And this is going to take it an action of a deferred action. So this, this one does not automatically complete the deferred that it returns when it's done. Now, it'll reject the deferred if an exception happens inside of this delegate. But it does. It won't automatically set its resolved to true. That'll be the responsibility of this action because this action is going to get a parameter, and that parameter is the deferred that was returned here. So this can be used in situations where maybe we have to step out of our asynchronous API and do an asynchronous option that isn't part of our asynchronous API, and this will allow us to do that. So we're not tied down to just using deferreds if we have another asynchronous operation that's completed in some other way, and we, we don't want to or uh, can't wrap it in our deferred API. So then we'll do a public static. We'll do the same thing, but we're going to do it, of course, of T. So, whoops, no, of T. In queue deferred of T, this I fiber that. And this, of course, will take an action of a deferred of a T action. Now, we could certainly write some more overloads, but I think this covers a very wide base. If we run into a situation where we don't have an overload that we can use, we can obviously revisit this file. So let's just talk about how we're going to write these, because they're pretty much going to be very, 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 very similar. So we'll do a var uh, then equals new deferred. So we're creating a new deferred. And I'll go ahead and just preemptively return that deferred. But what we want to do is we want to say that dot in queue. Remember, that dot in queue is invoking the in queue method on the fiber that we're operating on. And remember, the in queue method is kind of the entry point to the fiber. That says whatever whatever code that I passed in here with this with this closure, go ahead and execute it synchronously with all the other things that were requested on this fiber. So we don't have to worry about a resource contention or anything like that. Okay, so obviously we're going to open up a try block because we want to run the action. In this case, we're simply going to do action, then we're going to say, then set result true null. We'll do a catch. And this is going to be interesting. We're, we're going to catch RPC exceptions E, and then we'll say set result is false E.message, right? I'll talk about what we're doing here in a second. And we're also going to do a catch all, and this catch all is going to say, then set result false, there was a fatal error. Okay, so remember our concept of RPC exception. An RPC exception is an exception about some sort of business logic of our server that we intend to tell the user about. Oh, whoops, I'm missing a very important thing right there. And so the RPC exception is something where we intend to tell the user about. It won't contain any confidential information. That's why I'm separating out normal exceptions from RPC exceptions, because we intend for the user to receive this message. Um, so in this case, we, we, we do just that. We tell the user about the message. And um, then we do a catch all. And this catch all, uh, we, don't, we don't capture the exception because we don't need to. 
and we just simply tell the user that there was a fatal error. So this was something else, an exception that could perhaps send some confidential information. Obviously, it's very bad practice sending internal errors back to the user. And in this case, what we're doing, okay, if we blew up and we didn't get an RPC exception, that means that we have an issue somewhere and we don't want to tell the user any more details. And then of course, the most important line right here is line 27. Make sure you have that rethrow in there. If you don't have that rethrow in there, this exception's not gonna bubble all the way back up the call stack and get logged in our logs. So we wanna make sure to do that. And pretty much all these other things are going to follow virtually the same pattern. So I, this isn't the most fun code to write, but it's very important. So let's go ahead and get started bar then equals new deferred. And again, we're returning a normal deferred, not a deferred with the result. We'll preemptively return then here. Then we'll say that dot in Q, or again, in Q is primarily how we use the fiber. Try, now in this case, I'm gonna say then dot join action. So remember what join does. So if I go ahead and hit F12, oops, I hit F11, didn't I? Nope, I didn't, oh yeah, I did. Ah, go away. I don't want you. And now Visual Studio is frozen. Fun stuff. Public service announcement. When you hit F12, make sure you don't hit F11, especially on a large solution. Anyway, so uh, join, um, as you see the implementation, it simply says, go ahead and say, for the next thing, whenever it's done, go ahead and set it to what, set its uh, result to whatever was passed in for the second deferred. And that's what we want right here. We want to go ahead and invoke the action. And then on the deferred that's returned, we don't want this deferred to resolve or reject until the deferred returned by the action is finished. So we won't do then set result true because that would complete this deferred, that would resolve this deferred before the deferred that was invoked by this action. So then we're going to do the same thing, catch RPC exception. You know what I can... Hmm. I could put wrap this whole try catch catch thing in a method. I want I don't know if it's going to be inline though. That's my thing. We already are are very we're, we're, our call stack is pretty deep right now and I I you might not believe it, but I do try to keep the call stack relatively low on potentially performance critical code. And this is, I would consider in Q deferred to be performance critical code. So I'm not going to factor out our try catch catch into an alternative method because I'm not, there's no guarantee if it'll be inlined or not. And um, we don't want to uh, waste time where we don't have to. Um, of course, we're wasting time writing additional code, but this is something we only have to do once. Um, in fact, I might not be able to make a method, but I can use the magical power of copy and paste. So we'll go ahead and paste down those two catch exceptions or, or, or uh, catch blocks. Okay, so this deferred, remember this deferred simply returns a deferred with a result. So for this deferred, we'll simply say then equals new deferred, but this time we're doing a deferred of T. And then we're gonna return then. And then we're gonna go ahead and open up our try block. Whoops, don't open up the try block open up that dot in Q and pass in a nice little closure there. And I'm going to say try. And for this, I'm going to say then dot set result. And I'm going to pass in, well, let's see, pass in true and then action. Oh, it wants an error, doesn't it? True null action. So the first thing we're going to do is invoke the action. If the action succeeds, the result of the action, the thing that was returned from it, gets passed into our async pipeline into our then that's returned. So that's awesome. And let's go ahead and catch RPC. Oops. Um, let's copy and paste this. And there you go. Okay, so a slightly more complex one but not really. So we'll say var then equals new deferred. Now we're wanting to do a deferred of, let's see, we're wanting to do a deferred of, actually, I think I confused myself with this method. We don't need two generic type parameters. We only need one. There's no way for us to, I don't know why I thought that we could get away with that. Uh, there's no way for us to actually change the return type of this because this, the return type, the T here, is going to be um, implicitly uh, or inferred rather type inferred from the return type of whatever funk was passed in. So um, yeah, let's go ahead and leave it like that. So we'll do a deferred of t, 
like we did before, and we'll go ahead and preemptively return then. And we're gonna do uh, that to dot and Q, open up our nice little closure, try, and then this will be simply then join action. So it's the same thing, but if I hit, uh, if I put my mouse cursor in here and hit Control Shift Space, you'll see that the uh, the overload we're using here because of our awesome C sharp's awesome and very well thought out method resolution uh, algorithm, it's going to pass it into the deferred of T overload and not the um, not the non generic version, and that's the that's the behavior that we want. So then I'll go ahead and copy and paste our two catches in here, and everything is awesome. Okay, so this guy, um, this guy is going to be, oops, it's not even close, var then equals new deferred, come on, you can do it, return then, uh, that in Q, and we're simply going to do try, and for here, we're simply going to do action then, then we're going to copy and paste our blocks. So this is, uh, this, this method right here is, um, going to be, um, I always forget how to, how to split the window. No, I don't want to split, uh, I want to do new window, and then I want to drag it over here, then let's go ahead and go full screen. There we go. So we're looking at the file, the same file in two windows now. So you'll notice that this in queue deferred and that in queue deferred, these two, are, are virtually identical, but the only difference is, of course, is we're passing in the deferred into the action. So the action has the responsibility of resolving or rejecting it, whereas with the one on the right, the simpler one, we immediately resolve the deferred after the action completes. So we'll do action then, and uh, then we have our catch. I already copied that over, and it's awesome. So let's go ahead and jump down, and let's do this guy. This guy, um, you, you guys should be able to get this by now, because it's pretty much the same thing, except we're using the generic form. So var then is new deferred of t, pass, uh, pass into then, do that in q. Oh, come on. Sharper derped on me. It's been doing that quite frequently. Uh, try, and then we'll simply do action then. So it's it's pretty much completely identical to the top one, except we're instantiating a deferred of T. And now let's go ahead and grab our catches and dump them down there. All right, so that's it. Um, those are our in queue deferreds. So there's a lot of ways that we can use these. Um, like, um, uh, just to show you guys, I can go ahead and create our just a class right here. And this is a class that we're going to be creating pretty soon here. Any anyway, that's going to take advantage of these. And so I want to just wrap up this video with some examples of what we can do with these overloads. So I'm going to create a new class, and it's going to be called main lobby service. And like I said, this is a class that we'll, we'll be creating at some point um, ourselves. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a constructor, and he's going to own a fiber. So he's going to say fiber equals new pool fiber. Pool fiber, there you go. And um, let's go ahead and uh, create our field there, make it read only. And then let's go ahead and say fiber.start. So what's going on here is we're creating a fiber and we are instantiating it and we're starting it. And this is a pool fiber. There are many different kinds of fibers. There's thread fibers and pool fibers and actually maybe a couple more. I don't actually know how many. Uh, thread fi fiber, dispatcher fiber, which we won't be using on the server because this is for um, WPF. Form fiber, which is for um, wind forms. And um, GUI fiber, what does this even do? Another one for Windows Forms. And then pool fiber and stub fi fiber. So primarily we'll be choosing between pool fiber and thread fiber. So thread fiber is the simplest of them all. It's backed by, like it says in the documentation right there, it's backed by a dedicated thread. And sometimes we might want that. In fact, for our main lobby service, we might want that. But we're going to start off by using the pool fiber. Because the pool fiber actually goes in and integrates itself with Photon's built-in thread pooling. And so that'll make sure that not uh, too many uh, threads aren't made. Actually, I am going to go ahead and make this a thread fiber. I think the justification for that is... Um, um, I, I also want this fiber just to be an eye fiber, so it doesn't matter which one we instantiate in the constructor. But uh, my justification for using a thread fiber here over a pool fiber is if we use the pool fiber, we might be interacting or, or taking um, away from slots, available action slots, from requests coming into the Photon server. So we don't want that. Um, and the main lobby service, there'll ever only be one of them. So I think it's pretty easy to justify creating a uh, an entire thread, which is a fairly heavy process considering. 
and in our main lobby server. So it has its own dedicated thread and all the fiber will do perform its synchronization on that one thread. For other services such as, for example, well, we're gonna create lobby objects and, and lobby objects are gonna re be responsible for handling uh, players joining and leaving and all that fun stuff. We might create a pool fiber and I'm pretty sure there's a pool fiber that accepts a thread pool. So what we might do is instead of using the default uh, thread pool from Photon that, that is used for requests, we might go ahead and create a thread pool just for lobbies. So we can say, okay, we want a maximum of four threads ever to be created, so we don't create a million threads for a million lobbies. We just want to share the execution context between four of them, and uh, that might be a, a thing to look into. But anyway, as far as using this, for example, we might have something like uh, public deferred. In fact, we will have something like public deferred add player. And this is going to take in our um, um, a server context or a client context. Sorry. Actually, I, I messed up here. This class should not be in buzzmmo.server. Whoops. This should be in buzzmmo.server.master. So let's just take our main lobby service and drag and drop it over here into our buzzmmo server master and delete it out of our buzzmmo server and pretend that I never made that mistake. So jumping back into the main lobby service, which is in buzzmmo server.master, hopefully, uh, there we go. Uh, we can now accept a, uh, a master um, or a player context, player context master. So this is our add player, it's a deferred. And basically what we're gonna do is we're simply gonna say return fiber dot in queue deferred. And so for this, I have a bunch of overloads, a bunch of awesome things. Like for example, I can just pass in a straight up action. And this action, if this action succeeds, then it'll work. Or if I wanted to return a deferred of int, now you see we get some red squigglies, but if I said return zero here, because of C-sharp's awesome method overload uh, resolution uh, algorithm, by simply returning uh, zero right here, it's automatically gonna select the appropriate one out of these. But what if we wanted to um, return a deferred of int? So we can say deferred of, um, or deferred success of one. So here's a case where it's using yet another overload. So now we're returning a deferred that may be asynchronous, but in this case it's not, may be asynchronous, but still returns that value. And then again, if I come over here and press control shift space, we see it properly selects the correct overloads. So everything's just gonna magically work. And between all of these different overloads, it's gonna handle practically all the, or all the potential scenarios we might run into. Um, of course, I can also, if I accepted a parameter here, if I take off this int here, and if I accepted a parameter, if I said like then or something, now we're using the version of deferred that will only succeed when I call or only be resolved when I call then dot set result true null. So this is the only time this would be resolved. So again, that allows us to t hook into other frameworks. And that's really the power here of, um, of this system. Anyway, I'm gonna delete that and uh, throw a new not Come on, not implement exceptions, so it compiles. And I think that pretty much wraps up all I wanted to do in this video. We have our deferred API working with fibers and everything is awesome. In the next video, we are going to get our IOC container all working properly. We're gonna register all of our services and that's gonna be fun. And uh, we're also going to be talking about uh, connecting to our database and we're gonna be filling out our main lobby service. So at that point, we're gonna be able to join the lobby and or be have the server code for joining the lobby and seeing other players and that will be awesome so i guess we will see you guys then